Assalamu alaikum. Peace be upon you all. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allah. أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله أشهد أن لا إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله قال الله تعالى يا أيها الذين آمنوا تقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون All thanks and praises are due to God. We seek God's help and forgiveness. We seek refuge in God from the evil within ourselves and the consequences of our evil deeds. Whoever God guides will never be led astray and whoever God allows to go astray will never find guidance. I bear witness, there is no God, but God alone without any partners. And I bear witness that Muhammad is God's servant and God's final messenger. O you who believe, be mindful, mindful of God as it God's due and make sure you devote yourselves to God to your dying moment.
Quran 3, 102. My dear sisters, if you're married or about to be married or have been married before, then thank God for allowing you to witness one of his signs and his miracles, a sign the Quran mentions in 3021. Marriage in the Quran is strictly identified as a sacred relationship between two equal human beings and as a miracle that believers are urged to reflect on. In the Quran, marriage is uniquely described as a solemn pledge, mithaq, as we read in 421. With no doubt, this expression indicates a sincere relationship that is based on a serious commitment. To fully understand the term mithaq, it's sufficient to note that the Quran uses the exact same term to describe the covenant between God and prophets. Tranquility is asserted in the Quran as the ultimate purpose of marriage. Spouses are described in the Quran as a joy and as a close protecting garments to each other. Furthermore, the Quran describes marriage not only as a natural state, but as one's ideal state as well. Now, while no one walks down the aisle thinking of marital problems, no one can deny marital conflicts as a normal and even as a healthy part of every couple's journey together. However, no one, or perhaps very few of us, think of, uh, while they walk down the aisle, reflect and think of what's coming next and what to do to avoid marital conflicts or how to act when these conflicts take place. Today, I'm sharing with you the Quranic guidance on marital happiness. Can we find in the divine text some words of wisdom to resort to when the less, less expected and the unwanted takes place? First, let me start with you by addressing a verse that has been widely misunderstood by many as providing husbands three correction methods that start with admonishing women, can escalate to physically, can escalate to first psychologically abuse women by withholding sex, and finally can escalate to physically harming women by allowing beating. I'm sure you've all guessed the verse in question, 434, the most controversial and ambiguous verse in the Quran, the verse many scholars claim that is incorrectly mis misinterpreted and misunderstood than any other verse. 434, as I'm gonna be sharing my reflection with you, has nothing to do with marital conflicts. 434 is addressing the community, both men and women, with the three correction methods to deal with women in the community who violates laws. First, let me share the verse in its uh, common understanding, according to one mainstream translation. Uh, a, a, an excellent translation, the translation of Professor Abdul Halim, Oxford University Press, uh, 2010. And I'm using it as a sample of the mainstream understanding of 434 before we reflect together on the verse and I move to providing uh, a new translation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ar-Rijalu qawamuna ala nisa. Bima faddalallahu ba'dahum ala ba'd. وبما أنفقوا من أموالهم فالصالحات قانتات حافظات للغيب بما حفظ الله والتي تخافون نشوزهن فعظوهن واحجروهن في المضاجع واضربوهن فإن أطعنكم فلا تبغوا عليهن سبيلا إن الله كان عليا كبيرا Husbands should take good care of their wives with the bounties God has given to some more than others, 
and with what they spend out of their money. Righteous wives are devout and guard what God would have them guard in their husband's absence. If you fear high-handedness from your wives, remind them of the teachings of God. Then ignore them when you go to bed, then hit them. If they obey you, you have no right to act against them. God is most high and great for 34. As I mentioned, I'm going to be going with you over the language of the verse itself. I'm not adding anything external to the text. Let's go through a journey with the Quran to see what is the uh, uh, alternative of thinking of 434 as uh, a verse addressing marital conflicts. First of all, a rijal translated as husbands is not the correct translation of a rijal. A rijal is men uh, and, and not husbands. The first reason we have to exclude any marital context as the real context here of 434. Qawamun, which I take as a financial duty to spend. And it's optional, rewardable a duty. And the verse describes some men as qawamun. Those whom God favored some of them to some others. And it's interesting to notice that ba'dahum is masculine, to ba'd a masculine, which means the preference is not to all men and, and, and to exclude all women. It's not qawama, in other words, is not based on gender superiority, but it's a high rank that only some men deserve when optionally, when they consider spending on some female figures in their, uh, uh, in their families. So some men, and not all of men, can qualify to be qawamun, those preferred by God and those who consider spending. As we move with, with the verse, we read, Nisa, usually translated as wives, but Nisa in Arabic is women. The second reason we have to exclude any marital uh, 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 reference of 434. Asalihat, translated as righteous wives. Another conflicting message we get here. Because salihat is righteous women and not righteous wives. How do we know? From the Quran. In Quran, the adjective salih describes a, a righteous person and even a righteous jinni. So it applies to human beings and jinn. As we read in Quran 21.105 and as we read in 72.11. So... A, a saliha is a righteous woman, uh, not limited to being a righteous wife. It can be only a subcategory of it. فَصَالِحَاتُ قَانِتَاتٌ devout. And the question is, is qanitat, is zawja qanita, a, a qanita wife, is limited to wives? Again, no. Because iqnuti, uh, as a command, was addressed in the Quran, in 343, to mean be devout to God, was addressed to Mary, the mother of Jesus. And we know from the Quran that she was not believed to be uh, the wife of anyone. So the Quran draws so far a contrast between good women in the community, righteous, devout women, and will escalate from that to women who behave in a different way, with no consideration to the community, and the Quran will move into suggesting three correction methods to be held by the community, not by husbands. Good women, righteous women, are described in, in the Quran as hafidat lil ghayb. Al ghayb means uh, they guard uh, what God asks to be guarded and, and, and observed when unseen. Al ghayb means unseen. And the question is unseen by who? Many times 
is translated and understood as unseen by husbands or by their own husbands, not related to the verse and it's not true to the Arabic here. Women, righteous women in the community are women who observe what God uh, himself asks to be observed. Bima Hafiz Allah himself, as 434 literally says, even when unseen by anyone. Now it escalates to women who will act differently. Those who you fear their shoes. And the question is, who is the addressee here? The addressee, as we can easily find, if we just go back a little bit to 429, is, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, O you who believe, or O believers, which means that the verse is not addressing husbands, it's addressing the community or the authority probably in the community, both men and women. If we go a little bit to the following verse, to 435, we see the same reference back again to the community. And my question is, if the preceding, preceding verse is addressing the community, and the following verse is addressing the community, and we have no single reference in 434 to husband-wife relationship, so why to assume that 434 is addressing marital conflict with, with, with these three so-called recommendations of, of correction methods? This is something I call and I refer to in my research as the male addressee fallacy. Every time in the Quran, when a verse is addressing the community of believers, both men and women, and in Arabic, it can use the same subject pronoun as if it's addressing a, a, a male uh, community. It is, it, it's unfortunately, it's understood and misunderstood as making an exclusive reference to men and men alone, or even to husbands alone. Now, after uh, uh, making this note on who's the real addressee in 434, Let's move to the three correction methods. The first one goes with uh, 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 wealth and which, which I take as, as warning, probably congregation warning and uh, uh, maybe uh, court warning, repeated warning. Uh, we don't know the, the number uh, of, of how, how many times this warning can be given because it's left to the community itself to decide that. And what is the fear? The fear of Nishus. While Nishus, in its later lexical development, uh, were, was, was exclusively, essentially interpreted as referring to marital disobedience, Nishus, as we read in the Quran, is, has a more general meaning. For example, if only we compare Nishus in 434 to Nishus in 4128, when we read, وَإِنْ امْرَأَةٌ خَافَتْ مِنْ بَعْلِهَا نُشُوزًا أَوْ إِعْرَاضًا If a woman fears from her husband Nishus or uh, negligence, then we can conclude easily that Nishus has a more general meaning and Nishus, which is any kind of high-handedness in, in relationships or any kind of behavior that show no consideration to others. And we can say that probably the shoes in 434 is just a sub subcategory from the general meaning of the shoes doesn't exhaust the meaning of the shoes. So uh, being disobedient to, to your husband is only one way of the shoes, but the shoes in 434 is more general, it applies to women in the community. Another evidence is nishus, as we read in the Quran in 58, 11, and here the address, the addressee is the community. If it say to you believers, uh, 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 rise, then, then rise, or stand up, then stand up. So nishus can be any behavior that can be best, des best described that different from the expected, different from what everyone else are doing. So when women 
violate laws, violate what is expected in the community. So three correction methods are suggested here. First, aiduhunna, advise them, admonish them, talk to them. Second, ihjuruhunna fil madaji'a, which is understood as a metaphoric reference to withholding sex, which is a psychological abuse in marriage. Now, ihjuruhunna fil madaji'a literally means leave them, leave them in bedrooms, in their bedrooms, or lock them in their bedrooms, which is a reference to house arrest as the second uh, a punishment when the first one doesn't work. And again, it's up to the community to go with that option. It's probably up to the community to decide how many times warning should take place before an escalation can, can, can be, be proposed from that to house arrest. Majja in Arabic is a noun, uh, a place noun. And it's a form very known for speakers of Arabic. When a noun is driven from a verb, like masjid. Masjid is driven from the root sajada. It's a place where you prostrate, sajada. Majja is a place which, which is driven from the root daja, where you lay down, which is your bedroom. And uh, a house rest for women, probably for women of the seventh century, was more plausible as uh, a punishment than sending women to state prisons. Probably they didn't have state prisons at the time. Houses used to be just one bedroom. Women until today uh, can be wronged if just grouped with men, if just lumped with men. And we know that women, the elderly, orphans are prioritized in the Quran as to be protected social category. Women, when sent to prisons, are more subject to sexual harassment and to uh, their, their reputation smeared to the end of their lives, even after they're done with their sentence and even after they're back to, your, to, to, their, to their homes. So maybe house arrest was suggested to punish women while saving their dignity. Ihjuruhunna fil madaji'a leave them in their, in their house, at their homes, in their houses. Finally, it can escalate to idrubuhunna. Before uh, 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 discussing beating as, as uh, a final suggestion, uh, a, a big contradiction, self-contradiction between suggesting withholding sex as a punishment and between a severe punishment in the Quran uh, uh, which we read in 58, 1 to 4, uh, uh, when a man verbally threatens to use intimacy as a way to correct his, his wife, there's a contradiction between allowing withholding sex in 434 or, or even commending withholding sex as a marital punishment and between the severe prohibition of doing that in 58, 1 to 4. In 58, 1 to 4, the Quran comes to end uh, what was uh, uh, called the har or, or referred to as the har, a pre-Islamic marital punishment where a man threatens his wife by saying, you're to me like the back of my mother, dhahar, dhahar, back, and the word comes from that, uh, indicating that he has no interest in her and he's going to be punishing her by, by this type of psychological abuse. A man who verbally announced the intention of doing that, according to 58, can't go back to his wife as a husband and a wife before he e either sits a slave free or fasts for two uh, months without stopping, without posing, without taking a rest, which means it's not allowed to use intimacy as a way to solve problems in marriage. So how can 434 allow that or even recommend that? Finally, beating, beating as, as a, a, a suggested punishment. Uh, beating is up to the, communi to, to the community. So if the community, I argue, is with uh, stopping or posing beating even as a plausible option and satisfied by, satisfies by 
uh, house arrest and by even satisfies by just warning that is totally fine, that is totally Quranic. Why? Because the Quran, as we can observe here and in the rest of the Quran, uses a very general language. This is the style of the Quran, generality. And the language is even more general when we move to legal issues. The general rule in the Quran, as we read in 458, If you rule, if you govern people, seek justice. And justice is left there. What is just? A big question. And it's left in the Quran to courts, to congregations, to people of every community, of every time, of every space. What is just now is not just, won't be just after 100 years or before 100 years. So it's up to the communities to move between these correction methods, to cancel some of them, to cancel all of them. The intensity, how many times they can be repeated, it's, it's, it's left loose again as a clear indication that it's not a, a, a recommendation to angry husbands to go beating their wives as many times as they wish for, but it's up to congregations, courts, judges, and communities to go with that. Um, something uh, from even the behavior of our prophet, the behavior of prophet Muhammad. He never appealed to any of the three correction methods. Prophet Muhammad, as Aisha mentions, he was a walking Quran and he was a role model for, for Muslims. And the question is, why didn't he appeal to these three correction methods? This is a point that uh, John, Professor John Andrew Morrow stresses in his amazing book on 434 as well. So if the prophet is a role model and he never appealed to any of these three correction methods, so why to really think of 434 as addressing marital uh, conflicts? Finally, I will end by saying that the other self-contradiction between 434 is between uh, the three so-called correction methods in 434 and the command of We read in 419, live with them according to what is known to be kind. Ma'roof in Arabic, what is known from arifa, from the root to know, and it can stand for a favor. Do me a ma'roof, do me a favor. And how can be uh, uh, admonishing uh, uh, wives, uh, withholding sex and abusing them in a psychological way, uh, indicating that you're not uh, attracting to me, I'm not attracted to you anymore, either verbally or in behavior, uh, or how can beating wives be uh, uh, described as ma'roof? So with this, I move to uh, uh, a proposed translation of 434. Bismillah. Men are the financial guardians of women. Those men whom God has favored some of them to others and those who spend from their money. Righteous women are devout. They guard what God asked to be guarded even when they are, when they are unseen. Those women among you, believers, whom you fear recalcitrance, admonish them and place them in house arrest and strike them. If they obey you, seek no more correction. God is most high and great. I say what I've said. May God forgive all of us. Alhamdulillah, all praise and thanks are due to God alone. After we excluded 434 as a verse providing advice on marital conflicts, the question is, what is the Quranic guidance for happy marriage then? 
In fact, if we move from 434 to 4128 and to 435, we find two uh, uh, correction steps or two beautiful, I would say, advice provided to couples and then to the community in cases of marital conflicts. The first step is what we find in 4128. And this advice is provided to the couple when the problem starts and before it escalates to beyond what they can solve together. We read, Bismillah, وَإِنَ امْرَأَةٌ خَافَتْ مِنْ بَعْلِهَا نُشُوزًا أَوْ إِعْرَاضًا فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِمَا أَنْ يُصْلِحَ بَيْنَهُمَا صُلْحًا وَالصُلْحُ خَيْرٌ وَأُحْضِرَةِ الْأَنفُسُ الشُّحْ وَإِنْ تُحْسِنُوا وَتَتَّقُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ بِمَا تَعْمَلُونَ خَبِيرًا If a wife fears first from her husband, min baliha, first high-handedness, nushuz, or i'rad, alienation from her husband, neither of them will be blamed if they both together come to a peaceful settlement, for peace is best, although human souls are prone to selfishness. If you do good and are mindful to God, God is well aware of all that you do. The verse starts by addressing the wife with what to do next. And I take it as a very beautiful uh, all Quranic verses are beautiful, by, I, but I take it as a very a beautiful uh, consideration of a woman feelings in marriage. Usually it's, it's the woman who starts feeling that her marriage is not going to the direction she wants her marriage to go with. So if you fear, and the Quran is, is advising women not to wait for the last minute, before getting proactive about something wrong going with her marriage. The Quran is advising women not to suppress their feelings, even before anything wrong happens. If only you fear high-handedness, which is general, nishus, any behavior that your husband is doing that doesn't fit the expected. And again, as I mentioned before, nishus is general because what is appropriate in one community is different from what is appropriate and expected in another community. So if a husband is acting in a way that is, doesn't, I would say simply live up to your expectations or the second uh, beautiful uh, consideration, the second, the second reason to be concerned, not only high handedness, but also alienation or negligence. If your spouse is not paying or, or behaving in a way that is with, without showing any consideration to your feelings, or probably his heart is, is somewhere, uh, uh, some, some other place, don't wait. The Quran takes women's feelings as a, pri as, as a priority. Women can be hurt and wrong, not only by, 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 by what their husbands do, but also with what their husbands fail to do or to notice or to acknowledge in their relationship. The Quran says, if you only fear that, and then the, the, the addressee jumps, jumps immediately from from the wife, to the dual form, there is no blame on both of them to sit down and discuss the, the, the problem. So, it's an immediate uh, invitation to start a verbal communication. It takes women from your concerns to what to do with this concern. Immediately start a dialogue with your husband, with your partner, your spouse. Address the problem, verbally address the problem. The Quran is encouraging couples to do that. Verbal communication. And the Quran is recommending peace. Peace is is the best status to be at as couple. And then immediately uh, an expression is inserted for the first minute you think, why is this relevant? When we read, وَأُحْضِرَةِ الْأَنفُسُ الشُّحْ 
Human souls are prone to selfishness. Why is this related to the dialogue? The Quran is warning couples. Starting a dialogue can be challenging at times, the Quran is saying. Because what happens when we start discussing a problem, many times we end up creating a problem. And this is what makes many spouses uh, uh, refrain from doing that or uh, uh, get discouraged from addressing problems because they jump into your blame, my blame game. You did that. It's your fault. Uh, uh, it's your habit, right? So the Quran is warning couples, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be challenging. And the Quran is saying all the human souls, male and female, all the human souls are prone to selfishness. So expect hardship with that dialogue, but don't lead that fear uh, 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 makes you, discourage you from starting the conversation. So this is the first step. The couple, they should sit together, try to verbally address problems. They should remind themselves, um, and the Quran reminds both of them it's not going to be easy. And the Quran moves with, if you do good and you're mindful to God, and God is aware of what you do, the Quran recommends al-ihsan wa in tuhsinu. And al-ihsan comes from ahsana, to go beyond the duty and to beautify everything you're doing, even beautify the words you choose for reproaching your husband, beautify the language you use to reproach your wife or to address the problem. And what, what can be best than a reminder of fearing God? Fear God. If I fear God enough, I won't blame you for things I do. I won't involve in your, your fault, my fault problem. I'm the ideal person. You're the one who makes mistakes. I would acknowledge what I'm doing and I will move forward with, let's learn a lesson and move forward. Step one can sometimes, and to be realistic, sometimes uh, some can be challenging to some couples to the degree that it goes beyond what they can do together. How will the Quran deal with that? It moves into step two. And this advice now uh, is addressed not to the wife or the couple, but to the community. And it's translated to what we call today uh, marriage counseling or probably even families can still play a role today in some communities where families are still involved in, in the marital life of their kids. Uh, in in 4.35, we read, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاقَ بَيْنِهِمَا فَبْعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ يُرِيدَ إِصْلَاحًا يُوَفِّقُ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيمًا خَبِيرًا And if you fear dissension between the two, and you, as we explained, going back to 429, is the community of believers. If you fear the, the problem is escalating beyond what the couple can do with, maybe they have uh, uh, anger issues. Maybe every time they sit down to solve a problem, they end up with more problems. Then seek wisdom from those from the two families. The Quran says, send an arbitrator from his people and an arbitrator from her people. So send someone on your behalf, someone on his behalf. They're gonna sit down. Probably they're gonna be less angry about dealing with problems. Maybe they can address the problem better than you can do. Appeal to wise people in both families. Something so special the Quran brings our attention to as well here. It says, in yurida islahan yuwafiq Allahu baydahuma. If they both desire reconciliation, Allah will cause it between them, which means only sincere people who want the best for the couple will be able to resolve the problem. And I take it as an advice to be very wise and savvy in picking who's, who's, who's the person you're sending to speak on your behalf. Send person who wants the best for you. Send person who was with this marriage from the, the first day. Send a person who wants your happiness. Don't send, uh, no offense, if, if someone in your family uh, are, are, uh, is not on good terms with your spouse, you don't send them. 
because they will end up escalating the problem. And instead of both couples fighting, they will do the fight in, in, instead of, of, of both of you. Send someone who kept advising you every time you go to them with a problem by saying, no, you have a good wife. No, you have a good husband. No, you have kids. No, you have to stay together. It's, it's best for both of you. Send someone who really interested, who's really interested in making peace happen. And we have a divine promise here that if you send the right people, Allah will cause it between them. Indeed, in Allah kana alim and khabira, Allah is ever knowing and acquainted with all things. God knows everything. With this second, a beautiful advice, I can end the, the Quranic a guidance for happy marriages. Sisters, as we've seen, the Quran commends verbal communication as the first step to address marital conflicts. The Quran urges women to start a conversation with their spouses and warns both couple about its challenges associated with that. It's all, it's all about the words you choose. Words can start a relationship. Words can end a relationship. Words can restore the missing tranquility in marriage. Words can hurt at some times. Words can heal at other times. In Syria, we have a proverb. It says, al-malafiz sa'adi, which means what you say can make you, ha can make you happy or can be loosely translated as happiness is in what you say. In fact, you can name the verb in Arabic uh, can translate to both to injure and to talk. With this, I'm leaving you today and with this request to share a, a message of love, a verbal message of love with someone you love. If you're like me, guilty of having my, my phone with me all the time, use it to, te to text someone you love today and now. Probably with the Q&A, uh, we share what we texted and people we texted. Uh, send a text message to your spouse, to your wife, to your husband, to your son, to your daughter, to your neighbor, to your mother, to your father, to your sister, to your brother. Send someone you really care about them and tell them you care about them. Send them you love them. Tell them you love them before it's too late to do that. In Allah, ya'amru bil adli wal ihsan. وإتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون God commands justice, doing good and generosity towards relatives and God forbids what is shameful, blameworthy and oppressive God teaches you so that you may take heed Quran 16.90 كل ما أحيى إليك من الكتاب وأقم الصلاة إن الصلاة تنهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعمل يعلم ما تصنعون. Recite what has been revealed to you of the book and stay consistent in prayer. Indeed, prayer restrains the human from lewd and wicked behavior. But the remembrance of God is even greater and God knows everything you're doing. Quran 29, 50, uh, 45. وأقم الصلاة let's perform the prayer الله أكبر الله أكبر أشهد أن لا إله إلا الله
Come at us, Salah.